Welcome to the series Tipping Point. I want to welcome those of you who are joining in online. Also to my friends out at Madras and Northgate, I want to say uh, good morning. We're glad you're here. We're in this new series, and in this series we have a very narrow agenda. And uh, I want to just say it out loud so that you don't think I'm trying to hide it. In this series, we would like all of you who have been investigating Christianity, we'd like you to become one uh, over the next four weeks. Uh, maybe you're here and you've been coming maybe even just as recently as the last series or maybe you've been coming for a while and you came because somebody begged you to come. And maybe you used to go to church and you never really thought much about it after you stopped coming, but now you came back and you don't really know why, but once you came back, it was different and something began to happen and you continued to come back and you don't like for anybody to know it, but every week it's emotional for you. Something's going on in you, and you're right on the edge. I mean, it's, it's like you're sitting on the edge, but your foot is firmly on the brake holding back. Well, over the next four weeks, uh, we're hoping that you'll stop resisting that tug of the thing that's tugging at you, and you'd become a follower of Jesus. Now, some of you are here, and you're not sitting on the edge with your foot on the brake, you're not even in the car. In fact, you only came because somebody you respect begged you to come, and you're, you're their friend, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, my goodness, here we are. He's not five minutes into it, and here comes the hard sell. It's like, what do I have to do to put you in a relationship with Jesus today? Well, really, that's not what we're trying to do. That's not my heart in this at all. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. What I want to talk to you about is what I've observed over the last 20, 25 years or so of working with adults who weren't Christian and then who became followers of Christ. And when I say they became Christians or followers of Christ, I don't, I don't mean that they became a better person. I don't mean they started going to church when they didn't go to church. I don't even mean somebody who believes that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world and even their own sins. What I mean is... I'm talking about a person who decided that they would take the leadership of their life, the control of their life, and they would hand it over to Jesus and decide to follow Jesus. That they would reorient their life around the teaching of Jesus. That they would follow him in the way that they did marriage, in the way they did parenting, in the way they did finances, in the way they did relating with their friends and the people around them. That everything in their life, they decided they would reorder their life around following Jesus. See... I want to do everything I can in the next few weeks to help those of you who you have questions and you've, you've come to the edge and you think, I'm not, I'm not ready I, because I still have questions. I want to share with you what I have noticed about how adult people who have questions become followers of Christ, what I've noticed over the last 20 years or so. Now, I know that my hope is a little naive and it's unrealistic because if you aren't a Christian, I mean, there's a reason you're not a Christian. And it's been my experience from talking to people that when people have reasons for not being Christian, they're pretty good reasons. I mean, maybe, I mean, what I mean is if, if you and I sat down to eat and you started saying to me, Ed, you know, I'm not a follower of Christ because, I mean, just look at the world. Look at all the stuff that's going on in the world and all the bad that happens to really good people. And we tried to talk about that a few weeks ago, and, and maybe that helped you, but you still have questions. I mean, what I'm saying is if you and I sat down to eat and you said that's your reason for not following Jesus, I wouldn't say, man, that's stupid. You need to follow Jesus. That, that's an obstacle for you, and, and it's real. For, for some of you, the reason that you're not a follower of Christ is you know too many followers of Christ. I mean, you just, you've known Christians your whole life, and your thought is, I'm better than them. I mean, I know I'm a better person than they are. I know I treat people better than they do, and why would I want to follow Jesus if, if that's what happens to you? I don't want to become like you. That's valid. Or maybe you started this, buy into this whole thing, and you've been coming, and you're a little surprised that you buy in it, but you come from a whole different faith background or tradition, and, 
As you start to buy in it, the question hits you, but what does that say about all the rest of my family that believes this other way? What does it say about me if I'm this way? Or you have a particular thing in your life that you know the Bible teaches, and you think, well, if, if I buy into this thing of following Jesus, what does that say about me? And so you put the brakes on because, I mean, you'd be foolish not to ignore what that says about you and your family and all of that. that that's valid. Now, I think there are a lot of people that that's not any of you. You don't, you don't really have a specific objection to why you don't follow Jesus. It would be more like if I sat down and talked with you and I said, hey, why don't you become a Christian? You'd be like, well, why don't you become a safari God? I'd be like, what? I mean, I, I don't want to be a safari God. And you'd go, exactly. I, I don't have a problem with you. I'm happy for you that you're a Christian, but it, I just don't care. It just doesn't matter to me. I I don't. I just don't want to be a Christian. So for me to say that in the next four weeks I want to talk to you and all of those different kind of people and others are here and you're not a Christian and that I want to help you become a Christian in just a few weeks, I, I know it's a little naive because you have obstacles and they're important to you. But here's what I've observed. We have lots of people at Community Christian Church at all of our campuses. We have people who became Christians a, as adults and very few followers of Jesus become followers of Jesus once they got all of their obstacles and removed or their questions answered. What I mean is, it's not very often that someone says to me, look, I don't follow Jesus because I can't get the whole resurrection thing. And then, you know, somebody gives them a book about explains the evidence for the documentation and how that came about and the eyewitnesses and all of that, and they read the book and a person gets to the end of it and goes, oh, I see and then they become a follower of Christ. That's not normally the way Christians, be, people who are adults, become followers of Christ. I mean, I've had conversations with many people who aren't followers of Christ, and they'll throw their obstacle out, or they'll throw their problem out, and we'll spend our time dealing with that obstacle. And even when I get to the end of it, and I can explain to them why it's not really an obstacle, just giving them information about their problem doesn't lead them to becoming followers of Christ. Because adults don't normally become Christians because they work through their obstacles or they solve all the problems they have in their mind. Instead, something happens that shrinks the obstacle or shrinks the problem for them. I mean, they have the same questions. They have the same obstacles. They, they become Christian, and they just carry those questions and those obstacles with them into a relationship of following Jesus because becoming a Christian as an adult rarely involves working through obstacles. Instead, something happens, and it shrinks the obstacles for them. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I've seen happen so many times, I couldn't even count them, is that, again, a, a person has a problem, they, something happens, there's a, there's a tragedy, there's something painful that comes in their life, and they had all of these issues, you know, well, what about the miracles and walking on water and about the Bible? I'm so sure that all of that stuff happened. They have these big problems. And then a tragedy hits or pain comes into their life. And in a moment, they find themselves praying to a God that a little bit earlier they weren't even sure they believed in. And when they begin to pray, something happens. And it becomes very, very personal to them. And then whether or not Adam and Eve were real people, and then how did they get the dinosaurs on the ark, and how did he walk on water, and all of that, who wrote the Bible, none of that matters because in a moment when they began to pray, it, this huge obstacle they had to faith, it got shrunk as the object of their faith became very personal. They didn't go away. Their questions didn't go away. The obstacles didn't go away. But now the questions got smaller, and the idea of God got way bigger in their mind and way more personal. I've seen people develop extraordinary faith when their child got cancer. Or I've watched men and women both who something happened and pain came into their life because they got convinced that I'm addicted and if I'm ever going to be unaddicted, I'm going to have to have someone take over control of my life. 
And in that moment of pain, in that moment of tragedy, the questions and obstacles they had about God and the Bible and Christianity and all of that, they didn't get solved. They just reached a tipping point where they experienced God and they experienced him moving in their life and they moved past the questions. And suddenly God went from being a category in their mind to being a someone. Now, it doesn't always work that way. I'll admit it. I, there are people I know that I could point you to that they just sat down and they began to read the Bible. And maybe they began to read the Bible to prove that it wasn't true. But through reading the Bible, or I could point you to a number of pe- people that someone taught them a principle from the Bible. And they began to apply that principle. Maybe like Dave Ramsey taught them the principles in the Bible about how to handle money. And they began to apply it and began to work. And as they applied it, they began to think, I think there's a someone behind this principle. And what had gone from just being a category of God became personal as they experienced his work in their life. But most of the time, I mean, they had these objections and they had these questions about faith. And and through reading the Bible, they began to think, I I think this is true. And that's why when I talk about this, even though... I mean, even though we just did a series where we we answered questions, and I was glad to do that, and I love talking about that kind of thing, I know that when we get to the end of it and we answer your questions and you have more information, that it doesn't move most people to following Jesus. Because Christianity isn't a philosophy, so it's not about getting your questions answered. Uh, Adults decide to follow Jesus when their questions get shrunk by an experience they have where they reach a tipping point and they move past their questions and they experience God. Now, if you're here and you're thinking, Ed, if you think I'm going to be so intellectually dishonest is I'm going to give up my questions and the obstacles that kept me from faith in God because I have some kind of experience, because I have some painful jailhouse conversion, you're just wrong. I'm not that kind of person. I don't think that way. I just couldn't be that intellectually dishonest. Well, I understand that, but could I just say to you that for most of us, we've already done this in another arena of our life. There's been another arena of our life where for most of us, we had huge questions and we had huge obstacles from moving in this arena of our life, but we've already moved past those questions and experiences because we reached a tipping point where we had an experience that moved us past it. In fact, I'll just give you the example. I could give you a couple, but I'll, I'll give you this one. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about men. Uh, men, I want you to remember back, most of us in here are either married or we have been married. I want you to remember back when, when you were single. And remember back before you were married and when somebody would ask you, hey, why aren't you married? Well, you had reasons. I mean, you had all kinds of reasons of why you weren't married. I mean, in, in fact, some of you are single or single again, and, and you have reasons why you don't ever want to do that or do it again. I mean, you're happy being single, and you're really happy when you look at your married friends who aren't all that happy, and you go, yep, I'm glad I'm single. And, I mean, it could be you got questions like, or, or obstacles like, I don't want to give up my freedom. Ed, I, I don't want to give up my freedom. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want somebody else telling me what I, I want to do. Or, Ed I, don't, Ed, I don't have enough money to buy all the things that I want to buy. Why would I marry somebody? I know I wouldn't have enough money to buy the things I want to buy and she would want to buy. Or maybe you have the obstacle of other married people I know. I mean, look how unhappy every married person I know is. Why would I want to do that to myself? Or... Here's one I used to get that was really big when I was working with young people. They'd say to me, Ed, what if I choose somebody and then I meet the one? You know what I mean? Ed, like, what if I'm at the wedding and I say I do, and then in the reception hall I see the one? What then? Now, here's the truth. All of us who are married, how many of us who are married We worked through all our questions and obstacles before we got married. None of us. Okay, maybe you're the one. I I just haven't met you. I haven't met the guy who sat down and said, okay, I'm going to list out all my objections to why I don't want to get married. I'm going to put them on a list. Okay, freedom. And I read a book on freedom. I talked to a counselor about my fear of giving up my freedom. And check, I'm ready to give up my freedom. And then I sat down and I 
figured out on a budget how much it would take for two people to live, and I saved up enough money, and when I was 72, I finally got married. Or I, I thought about all the problems that I would have, and I considered what would happen if I met the one after I got married, if I chose someone, and I just made the decision that once I chose someone and I said I do, I'd have my eyes put out so I'd never see another woman. I, again, most of us don't decide to get married that way. Come on, most of us didn't work through our objections and questions before we got married. Instead, here's what happened. You met her. And after you met her, and you got to know her, and you began to love her, your questions and objections, they got smaller. Because before, when you would be asked about marriage, well, marriage was a category. But once you met her, marriage was no longer a category. Now it wasn't about giving up your freedom. Now it's about being with her. Now it wasn't about, do I have enough money? Now it's about, how can I share with her? Now it wasn't about, what am I going to do? See, you went from be being a category to you had met someone. Then it wasn't committing to a woman it was about being with her. And once you met her and you experienced being with her and loving her, everything changed. I mean, you still knew married people that were unhappy. But what you knew is that life with her, that you and her, you'd be different. Your questions didn't go away. You just experienced knowing a person and your questions got smaller and you reached a tipping point and you got married. What I'm saying is that's how most adults that I've met who weren't Christians, how they became Christians. They don't become Christians because they work through all their problems and their questions because whatever your obstacle is, it, it, if I gave you a book, I could probably answer your questions and you could read that book and you couldn't out answer, you couldn't out argue the author, but at the end of the book, you wouldn't be a Christian. Any more than explaining to someone when they have the argument about, hey, I don't have enough money, how you could figure out the money thing would make them married at the end of you explaining it to them. Christianity, at its core, is very personal. And we don't become followers of Christ because we get our questions answered and we move past obstacles and objections. Often, we just carry those questions and problems right into our relationship with Jesus because something happens. Something bad often something good, we experience something. And through that, we reach a tipping point where we experience God and we move past our questions. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying you shouldn't get your questions answered. In fact, we just did a whole series where we tried to answer some of the most common ones. And if you still have questions, the campus pastor at your campus, they'd love to talk to you. I mean, you you can reach out and email us at our website and we'll make sure somebody tries to work through you uh, with the questions you have. The point I'm saying is not, hey, just forget your questions and experience God. I mean, if it's a big deal to you, then it's a big deal to you and, and we want to try to help. All I'm saying is that most likely when you decide to follow Jesus, it will not happen most likely because you got all your questions answered and your objections out of the way. What will happen is one day you will reach a tipping point where you've experienced God and your questions will get smaller to you. And the reason that you look at some of us who are followers of Christ, and I know you can't say this out loud, so I'll just say it for, for you, is the reason you look at us and you go, I, I don't get it. I mean, you people hold down jobs and you're responsible and you raise families, but... You're so naive. I mean, how can you believe this stuff? I mean, haven't you looked at the world and how it works? Haven't you wondered about any of the things that I wonder about? And, of course, the, the answer to your question is, well, of course we have. Uh, of course we've had those same questions. It's just that once we follow Jesus, it's, it's not that we lost our brain. It's just that we just carried those questions and objections. I mean, it's, it, it's like we went from, talking about marriage as a category to we met someone and we wanted to follow him we fell in love with our savior now can i show you something from the bible out of the life of jesus i just want to i want to show you something this is just an introduction to this series and i, I want to remind you I, i'm not trying to give you the whole deal today and i hope you'll come back for the whole series i want to show you something out of the life of jesus 
And it's written in a book uh, written by a guy named John. And John is one of the eyewitnesses to Jesus' life. And the part that he writes here is right in the first chapter. It's, it's right when Jesus is just beginning to teach and he's beginning to get followers, the first original 12, to follow him. And how one of them became a follower of Jesus is exactly what we've been talking about, and I want to show it to you. It's in John chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. He said to him, follow me. And I guess Philip had heard enough about what Jesus was teaching, or uh, I've heard people say that he was just glad somebody asked him to follow, so he was a loser enough that he chose to follow. I don't know. I, I think it's because he had seen enough of Jesus and what Jesus was like that he wanted to follow because of what happens next. We don't have the details, but, but he followed. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, that's two other followers that we've talked about before, they're just in the verses before, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel. So Philip's so excited about Jesus and who Jesus is that he goes and he finds a friend of his, Nathaniel, and he says, we found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. Now, you just have to understand, Moses is like hundreds, thousands of years before Philip and Nathaniel are alive, and he had had a prophecy about how there was going to be a Messiah, a Savior, come to the nation of Israel. It'd be like me saying to you, hey, remember that prophecy that Aristotle wrote thousands of years ago? So he comes to him, and he talks about this ancient prophecy. Now, you also need to know that for most Jews in the nation of Israel at that time, they didn't even still really believe in this prophecy. They didn't really even think that, I mean, this was thousands of years ago, and it hadn't happened, and they just thought it was some ancient person, like you think about ancient people, who had said something crazy, and it was never going to happen. They didn't look for it. They didn't talk about it. It just wasn't at the forefront of their mind. So, again, it would be like one of your friends coming to you. They'd gone somewhere, and they'd had an experience, and they came to you, and they said, hey, do you remember that ancient that ancient prophecy from that guy way back. The first thing you'd go is like, no, I don't remember it. And then they'd remind you of it, and you'd say, we just found the guy that that prophecy was talking about. Now, what would you think about them? You'd think, I'm so sure. But Philip's so convinced, he didn't even care what Nathaniel says. He says, we found the, the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Now, Nathaniel's an honest guy. Na Nathaniel's one of those guys that if he's got a problem, he just lets you know he has a problem. And so he says it. He goes, Nazareth. And at the moment he says, Nazareth, Philip's like, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have said the Nazareth thing. I should have just said, we found the one that Moses talked about and the prophets talked about. Jesus, son of Joseph. We sh I shouldn't have brought up the Nazareth thing. And, and Nathaniel just says, Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Now, that doesn't mean anything to you because we don't have all the background, so let me give you a little bit of the background. In ancient literature, it's pretty clear that Nazareth is just a no-good town. It's a place that bad things happen in and bad people lived. It's a little bit of a redneck kind of place, and we don't really know why people didn't want to be there from sure, but it was... It was the kind of place that you didn't want to be there and you didn't want to be from there. Nothing good happened in Nazareth or came from Nazareth. And people just, it'd be sort of like, it'd sort of be like somebody coming up to you and saying, hey, we just found the cure for cancer. And you'd be like, you found the cure for cancer. Where did you find this cure for cancer? Did you find it with a guy at Emory? Did you find it up at the Mayo Clinic? Where did you find this cure for cancer? Where was this guy that cured cancer? And you'd be like, no, it wasn't Emory. It was Luthersville. And they'd be like, what? And you go like, Luthersville. You know, it's a town down in Merriweather County. They go like, I know where Luthersville is, but you did not find the cure for cancer in Luthersville. So Nathaniel's like, Philip, first of all, you didn't find the guy who's written in that ancient prophecy. And secondly, Nazareth, Bethlehem maybe, Jerusalem maybe, but Nazareth, I don't think so. Now, at this point, Philip could have done what lots of us try to do. He could have tried to answer his objective. He could have said, Nathaniel, if Nazareth is your objection, let me, let's go get the scrolls, and I'll show you how in the Old Testament, in the books that we've been reading, 
that in the prophets and in Moses, there are a lot of places that they talk about Nazareth. And Nazareth could, in fact, be the place that the Messiah is coming from. So if you have objections, let me just address your objections. And he could have talked about it, and they could have talked about it. And at the end of it, maybe he could have proven to him that the Messiah could have come from Nazareth. But you know what? At the end of it, Nathaniel wouldn't have been any closer to actually meeting Jesus. So he doesn't even talk to him about Nazareth. What he did illustrates what has been happening for the last couple of thousands of years to adults who become followers of Jesus. He says to his friend in verse 46, come and see, just come and see, come and see. Well, let's talk about the Nazareth thing. No, I I shouldn't have even said the Nazareth thing. Who cares about the Nazareth thing? Just come and see. Hey, you're you're my friend. Just, Just come and see, but I've got questions. I know you do. And when you meet him, just come and see. When you meet him, you ask him your questions. Verse 47. Now, if you're a person who you ask some questions, you should love this verse because in this verse the Bible just, the Bible just affirms your intellectual honesty about your questions. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Here comes a guy who won't pretend. Here comes a guy who won't say he just believes it because everybody believes it. If he has issues, he'll bring it up. How do you know me, Nathaniel asked. Here's what I want you to see. And and just so you know, again, I don't believe I'm going to be able to resolve everything today. In fact, this is just an introduction, and I'm really hoping and praying that you'll come back for the whole series and, and join in with us on this. But here's what I want you to see. Nathaniel asked the most important question. Jesus, how do you know me? How do you know me? I mean, a minute ago, you were just a category. You were a wannabe Messiah who came from a place that I knew he couldn't come from. And I had questions about Nazareth. But now the question is, Jesus, how do you know me? Jesus answered. I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called on you. Then Nathaniel said, okay, then explain Nazareth to me. No, that's not what he said. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Here's what happened. Once Nathaniel met Jesus and he realized that Jesus knew him, once he experienced Jesus, He'd already reached the tipping point, and we don't know if he ever got the Nazareth thing worked out. But this is a guy who Jesus said he wouldn't fake it. He became a follower of Jesus with his questions. That's what thinking, smart, rational adults, that's how they begin to follow Jesus. What I'm hoping will happen is that I mean, what I'm praying that will happen is that your very valid questions will shrink as you meet Jesus and you reach the tipping point. I'm praying that your very valid questions, some of your questions, they're intellectual and some of them are emotional and some of them, honestly, are just a smokescreen. I mean, some of them you know enough about Christianity to know that it says something about you that you don't really understand why it says it about you and you know that if you decided to follow Jesus that well you don't know how that it would affect you and so you don't want to think about that and what it would mean to you so instead you throw out well what about the Bible and what about miracles and they're really just a smoke screen for what is your real issue what it what will it mean for me and I don't have to convince you it's a smoke screen you know it's a smoke screen My desire is that the next few weeks, the obstacles that are really big to you and are really serious to you, that they'll begin to shrink as you meet Jesus. One day, Jesus is teaching, and some guys come to him, and they try to trip him up and embarrass him, and they say, Hey, Jesus, God taught us to obey lots of things, to do lots of things. What one of those do you think is the most important? The very first words out of Jesus' mouth is love. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. 
Now, my struggle has always been that I wanted to understand the Lord my God with all of my mind. Then, if I could understand the Lord my God with all of my mind, then I might give him a little bit of place in my soul. And once I gave him a place in my soul, I might serve him with some of my strength, and then maybe I could begin to love him. Jesus says, no, that's not how it works. God wants you to love him more than you want to understand him. But what I've discovered and what others that are sitting around you have discovered is that once I begin to love him, I've begun to understand me and him. But the initial invitation is, is not to get my questions answered. I, again, I'm not saying ignore them. You need to press and get answers to your questions. But the initial invitation of Jesus is, would you trust me and love me and just bring your questions with you and as you love me, you'll get some of the answers to some of your questions as your questions over time get smaller. Your heavenly Father wants you to know him more than he wants you to understand the answers to your questions. God says, I want you to know me more than you want to get your questions answered. But I want you to know me more than you want the answers to all your questions. If you'll begin to reverse the order of how you've been going out in your mind, you will get answers to some of your questions. But better than that, you'll begin to follow Jesus. So here's my challenge as we begin this series. I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer, and you may not be a person that ever prays except in dire circumstances, but I'm going to ask you that maybe for the next week or maybe for this whole series for the next four weeks that you'd begin to pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, because that's how he invites all of us human beings to address him. Heavenly Father, I want to know you more than I want answer to my questions. Father, I want to know you more than I want all the answers to my questions. You can still ask your questions. You can still press to get answers to your questions. But when you want to know God first, that's a request that your Heavenly Father is honored you asked and in time you'll get some answers and maybe that'll be the hinge that you reach the tipping point that once you experience God your questions will shrink and you'll begin to know him it begins as you invite him to make himself known to you more than you want answers to your questions next week we're going to look at, at this from a whole different angle and I hope you'll come back as we pray father I want to know you. Let's bow together and pray. Father in heaven, we want to know you. You say, if we seek you, we will find you. So, Father, here we are, all of us seekers. We want to know you. Will you make yourself known to us? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.